do that. So I'm going to skip a few things, but go right into right where I left off. I went into treatment, which wasn't real treatment. It was basically a three day get you sober clean thing and then they let me out I didn't learn anything there nor did I see anybody that was really wanting to help all it was for me was a, a time to get awake and clean and get off of the drugs so here comes my skipping part because I don't quite know how to put the rest of it I'm 33 years old I have one two three four five children four biological one not mine but mine anyway and I uh, don't have any of the baby mamas and for the most part I didn't even have my family I had myself and I had a great brand new addiction that I thought would keep me numb forever. So I'm slamming methamphetamine at this time. And I meet these people who say that we're going to go and commit a lick and get easy money. And all I heard was, let's, uh, let's get some easy money. And I was in a violent mood. And I was high. I was out of my mind. I was in such a rush at this point in my life that I didn't even know where I was really rushing to go. I just knew I had nothing better to do or anybody to care about at that moment, that moment in time, including myself. So we went up into Huntsville and we took a right. And I didn't know what street it was. I just knew what town I was in. And before I knew it, I'm seeing these signs that say Causey Dam. We're driving, we're driving. We start to see all these signs for ranches. And this gentleman pulls over and uh, says, Now I know of a cabin up here where nobody lives. He says, I think they just abandoned it. And uh, that's where this big roll of copper is and it, it weighs a bunch so we have to cut it into pieces and he did some work in this house years ago and he said that you know there was probably some things in there stuff that they had left now I'm in the front seat of the car I'm starting to, to unwind I'm not as spun as I was and I realized right then and there that we're fixing to do a burglary or break it to some nice place because everything around us is ranches and everything is nice and it's way up in the mountains and all of a sudden I start to get this feeling in my gut and it's exciting damn it all of a sudden I was sober but I got this feeling so we walked up this dirt chute and there was a beautiful cabin there. And these guys were weak now. These are these are people I don't know. They're just a ride. And one of the guys that I was with was the dope dealer. And I think I was only hanging around that particular man because that's how I was getting my free dope. And he was just giving me free dope for some reason because now that I look back at it, it wasn't that he liked me or anything. It was that everybody else we came across was jittery and nervous of me they wouldn't come around so they kind of left him alone and I was a shield for him and not even knowing he was just a little guy anyway I mean if I would have been in a different state of mind I'd have robbed him and took his dope and left wouldn't even have been at this house so they're trying to open this door and I look in the window and it's all marble and pretty and stainless steel and I look for an alarm just by nature just look up and there's nothing in fact I look down 
to my right into the power box and this thing is off the grid it's got its own power supply and it leads into a garage like type shed thing which I opened just to look and there's huge generators in there but these aren't the kind of generators I'm used to seeing because my stepdad had some generators this is a this is a power company this is a state something I shake it off I don't think anything of it I just shut the door I don't say nothing so I walk over to the door and I say you guys ain't gonna get into there you gotta do it like this and I put my full weight into it and I kick this door and I broke the wood on the lock the door didn't give on the first kick but the wood split so that second kick went right in they both kind of ran they were scared of the sound but there was no alarm so I walked in I was the first one in I didn't touch nothing I didn't have on any gloves and then the dope dealer handed me this he said here take this take this and he gave me this little piece of shit flashlight and two rubber gloves I said no where'd you get these rubber gloves what is this he says I have hepatitis C and so whenever I'm slamming my dope or I'm just getting high with other people he explained to me he uses these to keep the blood off of him and other people so I put them on and I'm looking at them and they're like latex gloves like my mom would wear and now I think okay now I can touch some stuff why don't I look around now all of a sudden I get this urge again and I'm, I'm starting to rush again I'm looking around it and I don't hear nothing but uh, I hear a sigh of relief or of ecstasy and I turn around and these fuckers are getting high in the house they're sitting on this couch that's really pretty in leather it's on wood it's obviously an expensive couch and I was about to say something to them and just leave because I mean if these guys were going to break into this place with me I mean they better get serious about it I mean I'm the one that kicked the door in I'm the one looking around ain't these guys going to do any work But instead of saying something to him, I go upstairs. And when I get upstairs, there's pool tables and there's all these deer heads. Anyway, I see this thing that says Rocky Mountain Power. Holy shit, I'm in their lodge. So I immediately get paranoid because now I know that there could be possibly cameras and who knows how they're powering this place. So I go downstairs to leave and these guys are out. Heroin and meth. They called it goofball. And uh, I grab the dope dealer because I have to take him with me, right? He's got the dope. I said, man, get up, man. We got to go right now. This place is no good. I have a bad feeling. No, man, we're fine, we're fine. Anyway, he gets up with me after I grabbed him by his shirt. And uh, the other guy kind of comes too, and he's bouncing off the walls all of a sudden. That I guess the meth part of this, this shot that they just did is kicking in, and so he's starting to be more coherent. He goes, okay, I'm high, let's do this. And uh, he starts going everywhere. I didn't see him. I didn't pay attention to him. I take the dope dealer outside, and that's when I see the biggest roll of copper I've ever seen in my life it was on a big wooden spool and there was no way that any of us could even together could lift it and that's when I saw my dope dealer kick in bro and out of nowhere he has a fucking sawzall and he's looking for an outlet looking for an outlet so was I It took us an hour or so to cut that big ass spool just one time through it. And there was still no way we could cut it. There was another cut just to even half that thing. So he cuts it into little pieces into manageable, let's say 150 pound lifts. We put um, three of them in fact, in a wheelbarrow, which tipped it over immediately. So we split it up. Each of us carry one. We put them in <laughs> sheets and we put them in whatever we could to almost duffel back carry it like you would see in a Huck Finn movie. And I hoisted mine over my shoulder and 
and out I went. I didn't care about them, the dope or anything right there. I just had 150 pounds of this, or maybe more because I'm a big guy, of copper, and I split. And I didn't hear nothing for a second until I heard footsteps and it's them right behind me. Then we get to this spot where we parked and uh, he, the, the guy said, you see, told you, easy lick, nobody was around. Nobody saw nothing. I want to go back, he says. So did my dope dealer. And then something kicked in on me and I all I wanted to do was get high and try to catch my breath. And that's stupid because my idea of getting high at that time was to smoke a joint and do a shot of methamphetamine. Anyway, they went back. They came back with a bunch of other shit, some guns and some stupid shit. Mm -hmm. And I drove home because they were inebriated enough not to drive and they had all this stuff and they were checking out their booty when we get back to Ogden we all split our separate ways exactly 24 hours later I hear a knock at the door and then I hear a boot and the door flew open and lo and behold there's Weber County Sheriff's guns out the whole nine yards and uh you know no, nobody's around just me you're under arrest sir you need to come with us they took me down to 12th street jail we were county jail and they said we want to know your version of the story and i was like what are you talking about why, why are you even arresting me and the, the cop was telling me so, a bunch of stupid shit and the ogden city cops weren't saying nothing they were letting the weber county sheriffs do all the talking I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And they're like, look, we know you did the burglary. We know you kicked in the door. We know you drove such and such as car home. We know everything. What we don't know is why you did it. And I think I'm slick. I was like, there's no way. What, what, I don't know what you're talking about, man. In my mind, I was like, I had on latex gloves. I didn't touch nothing. I didn't leave nothing. No DNA whatsoever. Yeah, fuck, I wasn't thinking I was high. I didn't know the DNA consisted of hair, skin, spit, sweat. Any part of you, right? I told the cop, I said, you ain't got my fingerprints. He goes, let me guess you were wearing latex gloves. And he pulled out this old ratted up hair and it had some blood on it. And he's like, did they look like this? He says, we have your, your friends and your accomplices. Your buddies are right here. They told us everything. Why'd you do it? I don't know what you're talking about, man. I tried to hold my calm all the way up until pre-trial. And then the, the pretender lawyer, the uh, lawyer that you get when you don't have money, he uh, pulls out these statements and he says, look, these guys are telling on you. They're putting everything on you. They're saying that you had the drugs. They're saying that you did everything and that you were strong on them and scaring them into doing this with you. He says, I can get you a deal right now. The cops know they're full of shit because these guys have a record. You don't. You've got some shit when you were younger. You've got some assault. But you've never done a burglary. You've never done a major theft. You've never done any of this. This is in their jacket. I can get you a deal if you trust me. He says, instead of taking... Because it was a first-degree felony burglary of a habited dwelling. Nobody was there, right? The fucking cleaning lady was in there hiding the whole time. She lives there year round. So, instead of a first degree felony, I can get you a deal right now in this thing called drug court. You ain't gonna do much time. If any, I mean, they're gonna give you a chance if you can complete this program. Take it, or you're gonna end up in prison with a first degree felony. I took it. They had me dead to rights. I couldn't lie no more. So I was like, all right, man. He goes, and you're going to have to give a statement right there on this on the stand right in front of the judge as you're pleading guilty and give him your version of the story. It doesn't matter what it is, just as long as you agree to what they say and you sign your name on the paper. 
Ah, fuck, man. I gave the guy the absolute truth, whether they believed it or not, and I took the second degree felony, 1 to 15 burglary, and theft. And they dropped everything else. So, I wasn't busted with drugs. I didn't get anything on me but paraphernalia in my apartment that they kicked in made me eligible for drug court. So I went into drug court. When you go into drug court, you have to plead guilty right off the bat to your charge. And they swore me in that Tuesday and I was released that next morning on OR. I reported to Weber Human Services. I gave them a baseline UA and that's when they told me all the heavy rules. Now, if you don't comply and meet up to their standards, no matter what happens, you're going back, not to jail, but to prison. You're going to do your stint. And how they sentence you is you say, sir, you are, you have now been sentenced, sentenced to one year to 15 or one year to 15 undeterminated time in the Utah state prison. And you say, yes, and you agree. And so I'm already sentenced. I'm just out doing this program so I get a job I was about to start to you know really get into it and then I get hit by a car and uh, the doctor prescribes me medication which makes me dirty on a UA and because I was in the hospital one month and I still needed drugs for pain because uh, my L3 L4 and L5 were crushed I had to have a fuse that made me ineligible to finish drug court and I knew I was going back to prison or going to prison never been there before but I knew I was going to prison so they gave me three days to turn myself in I have a new baby on the way I just got this girl pregnant I only known her a couple of weeks how do I tell her I'm about to go to, to the joint my mom is sick in the hospital and I didn't even know it she had pneumonia so I went to her house and nobody's there. I got three days to turn myself in. So I decide to go into her house and smoke some marijuana because I know she's got it. Tons of it, right? She's growing it. So I can't get in the house, dude. And uh, I'm upset because the key's not there and everything doesn't look the way it usually does. You know what the fuck? It's my mom's house. So we'll go around the back. I break a window. I hop through the window, I take a shower, I do laundry, I smoke a couple of joints, trying to get my mind back on how I'm gonna tell my new baby mama that in three days I have to turn myself in to go to prison. And all of a sudden, dude, I hear the door boom, slam open. And there's these fucking cops. It's the Weber County Sheriff's again. Why are you breaking into this house? They were all over me. And I was like, this is my mom's house. This is my mom's house. I don't, what's, what's, what's going on? Well, if this is your mom's house, why'd you break the window? I don't. I didn't have the key and I needed to get in. I tried to say everything I could. I mean, it was the truth, right? But at the same time, I was so fucking scared because I couldn't let him go all the way downstairs because they're about to find a large crop of marijuana. I'm like, look, man, here's, here's my ID. This is my mom's house. You know what I mean? I broke the window. You know, what are you guys even doing here? And I, I'm, I'm walking toward them so that they can't get down the hallway and smell this because the fans are about to not work. You know, the fans are blowing in the opposite way. They're about to smell it. And they're like, uh, you know, just tell us the truth. I was like, all right, look, man, my mom's out of town. I broke in here. I'm not supposed to be in here. Let's just go. Just take me. But you know how we do you not do you know how we're how we knew you were here, sir? The neighbor just heard you break the window and has been watching you the whole time and they just moved in. They've never seen you before. If this is your mom's house, how come they've never seen you before? Fuck. I figured whatever, you know, fuck it. Take me to jail. So they did. I figured, you know, my mom's gonna come home, she's gonna clear my name, she's gonna be mad I broke in her house and smoked some weed, but whatever. You know, she'll save my ass, right? Man. My mom was in the hospital for pneumonia and she didn't leave the hospital for 60 days. 
and her boyfriend and her roommate and my sister pressed charges on me and my mom's behalf in court for breaking and entering. Nah, fuck man, I was angry. I was coming down. I was high. And now I'm betrayed by my family. I went to prison, I kept my mouth shut. I didn't get a fucking letter or anything for two and a half years for nobody. But before we get into that, I went to prison. It was fucking May 15th and it was raining and cold. And they took me to Uina 5, which is the old death row. And these other guys that we took this little ride with on a on a little cramped bus or a van couldn't wait to get back man these guys have done this before man they could not wait to get back they were talking about biscuits and gravy and more movement and the way that i was hearing these guys talk man i was like you know maybe this ain't, maybe this ain't gonna be too bad you know what i mean it's better than we were kind of jail right i just sat there for 60 days trying to hope my mom was gonna save my ass but she sent me to prison she was mad and fuck at me so, this ain't gonna be bad. I can handle this, right? So you walk into UNA5 and all you see is a long corridor. And it looks like shit. It's, I've never seen anything like it. it was, it's the nastiest fucking place I've ever seen. Even the hack cops aren't touching the walls. And it's dirty. And I think they did it on purpose. And they told us, okay, everybody into the library. We're gonna process you one at a time. Processing is a trip. The library that they told us to go into ain't even a library. There's no even. There's not even books. What it is is a concrete box with a fence and steel bars all the way around it, and you've got one view, and that is at the cop that's standing there, right there, staring at you, who's sitting by the only toilet that's outside of this box. So there's no way to use the bathroom unless you ask him to, and everybody is chained to the waist, to the foot into the hands together. It's like a fucking row of monkeys, dude. It's like a big chain of monkeys. It's horrible. They were trying to break the fish. I didn't know what a fish was. I've heard the term fish from, you know, movies, shit like that. It's trying to break the fish. See who talks first. The fucking cops are fishing. Anyway. So they process us. My processing's was humiliating and degrading and I felt dirty because the cops take you out of your orange jumpsuit that they you're in from Weber County Jail and they strip you asshole naked right there in front of everybody right in the hallway other cops walking around people going to school down the hallway can see you standing in this fucking hallway naked turn around lift your balls you know, bend over, cough, the whole nine yards. I've never had any man tell me to bend over, spread my cheeks, show him my ass. Inmates are whistling, yelling shit like, can I get a date? Look at that fish, shit like that. I know I'm flush in the face, I'm blushing, I'm pissed, I'm mad. And I hear, oh, he's blushing, he likes his mouth. Fuck, I was so fucking mad. Look at this fresh skin. Only a couple of tattoos. They ask me what gang I'm from. So I'm not from no gang, man. I've never been in no gang. They're like, bullshit. Get your bald ass. Oh, big dude. What is that right there, man? Are you a sleeper cell? The fuck's a sleeper cell? Well, don't lie to me. We know you guys are fucking sleepers. I can tell. House him with his people. That's what I hear. So, R&O lasts 90 days. I go into fucking R&O and my first second there, I think I'm about to be alone. It's a big sale. I've never seen a sale like this. This thing's long. And I turn around and I hear this 
hack. Can you live with so-and-so? I, I don't even know so-and-so. Who? And they're like, he's white just like you. Can you live with him? Sure, I don't care. Whatever. And they push this guy in. And he looks just as stunned as I do. And then the bar slam. Oh, oh, oh. You hear this weird noise. Oh. And I look out and there's red lights going on like a fucking siren. And then I see this sign clear as a bell just in enough time. Do not put your head or your arms in the way of the door it's closing. And I just saw it in enough time because that sound was the chains pulling and the air from the hydraulics or whatever it is making a sound. And then it hears and everything slams shut. And that's when the realization hit me. I was like, oh fuck, I'm in prison. This ain't like Weber County Jail. This don't look fun to me. R and O is out of your cell for two and a half hours every other day for 90 days till they place you. Place me? Place me where? I didn't even know what the hell that fucking meant. All I remember is that cop say housing with his own. So, I hear these guys talking. They've been back and forth. They've done this before and they're yelling, what, what, what? Well, I know what that word means. That means white boy. I didn't know who they were talking to. Like, oh, your shit don't stink, Wood. You ain't gonna talk to us? Well, then fuck you. Okay. Whatever, dude. I still don't I didn't know what that meant. I just did my own fucking thing. And then all of a sudden, the door opens up. And this is my first night. They took that guy that they pushed in here and pulled him out. And they said, sorry for putting him in here with you. We didn't know. And then they shut the door. Boom! I'm gonna find out that guy was a sex offender. And uh, the cops put him in the wrong house. And they came and got him. Because if he would have gone where I went, he'd have been fucking killed. They house people different like that in this state. If you're a sicko. Good riddance too. Because if I didn't know what the hell he did or even knew his name, I'd have fucking got him my damn self. Now I was missing my kids. Who were probably pissed. I didn't know what was going on, but I was upset and I was emotional. So I probably would have done something myself. Now you're alone, Woodfish. Oh, Woodfish, look at your guppy ass. And then I asked, I said, are you talking to me? I never got a response. Whoever was talking that to me left. Old heads come into r &O, They're only there until their housing is open. I didn't know that either. So these guys talking to me were old heads. 90 days goes by. And they put me in this place called A-West. It's a four-tier scary motherfucker. Looks just like the movies. Big bars. Looks like they're housing King Kong. And the place is hot. It's the middle of the summer. My birthday's July 7th. I touched down in A West general population July 5th. And I'm hot. I'm on the fourth tier. There is no air conditioning. There's no nothing. This is the fucking shittiest I've ever been. I have these white boys walk up to me. Do you need anything? Are you a fish? Are you brand new? You look brand new to me. Yeah, I am. Where are you from? I said, I'm from Ogden. They said, no, man. What set you from? I didn't know how to answer that, except for I don't bang. I mean, I've never been quoted or jumped into anything. And he said, oh, all right. And he said, walk with me. So I walked with this guy. And he was pointing everything out. He was showing me where people were, but this walk was not a normal walk. It was a fucking... I'm on four tiers okay i'm on the fourth tier and you can't see the other tiers because they're below you but he's pointing shit out the whole time he was pointing to mirrors that were on the wall he says when you're down there you can't walk past this line you can't walk over here you can't do this you can't do that or you're going to be in the crypt section and they're going to think the woods are attacking you. if you go over there you look just like one of them he says by the way he whispers in my ear he goes are you a sleeper i says what's the sleeper stuff and that's when he explained it to me a sleeper is an unmarked gang member of ranking who is either a missile or an assassin. I said, no, nah, man, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. He goes, well, even if you were, you, you weren't, you're not allowed to say it to me anyway. And then he tried to shake my hand in a funny way. And I, I didn't know how to shake his hand. He goes, yeah, you're not. And he laughed at me. 
He says, come with me, fish. And I was like, and I, all I could say quietly is, please don't call me fish, man. I don't want people to think that they can just try to feed on me. He goes, don't you worry about that. Sharks feed if they want to. So he's pointing some other stuff out. I'm starting to think this guy's pretty cool because uh, who's going to tell me all these fucking rules, right? Uh, he goes, uh, look, the shot caller's going to be back in a second. He gets back from work. And he's going to tell you what he expects of you. Shot caller. I've heard it in rap songs. I've heard it in all kinds of shit. Now I'm about to get to meet a shot caller. And I assume he's white because this guy's white. And I just realized the guy talking to me had a great big AB across his neck. Big one like this. Huge. And then he's got a funny little weird looking sign on the back of his head. And that meant saw. Cool crosses. Skulls. Ranking and insignia all the way around it. Real colorful. Pretty looking. If it would have been colored except it was tattooed black. Anyway. This guy comes up to me. He tells me his name. And we talk for days. And this is an older man. Tells me he doesn't even, he doesn't think he's ever gonna get out. He was on his twenty something year, twenty second year at this time he was meeting me. He tells me they could let me out, but they probably won't. He's slung down from head to toe. He looks scary. He's built. He's fucking ripped. The motherfucker shook my hand and it was like a brick. Tell, tells me his age that I could I didn't believe him. I was like, you're that old. Hope what the fuck? He goes, this place preserves you. We work out every day. And if we don't, it's because it's our holiday. He says this prison is their job. This is where they come, but this is our house. They have their rules, we have ours. I expect you to follow them both. And if you don't, you're gonna get ran over by both sides. The hacks and us, we have our own convict code of conduct. And I'd kind of been waiting my whole life to hear something like that. I mean, this book is raw, right? I don't believe in what he's saying. And I didn't know how to express what I wanted. So I just told him I want to do my time and get out of here. He goes, you know what? I've been listening to you for days now and I've been watching you. He says, you didn't come in here to gangbang. You weren't coming here bang, gang bang. And when you got in here, you shouldn't leave gang banging either. You might not leave at all. This is somebody of your size we would love to have, but I don't need you. I suggest you run independent and you might be able to have friends on all sides. Run independent? Yeah kind of explained it to me and he kind of left it at that and then he says but if you deny my offer we will turn our backs on you and you are on your own he told me exactly what that meant and I wasn't scared so what if somebody tries to come and get me I have to hold my own and fight well fuck I've been fighting my whole life I don't give a fuck after all, I don't know nobody. I don't know no Crips or no Bloods or fucking no real prison gang sets. I didn't know nobody here. I don't need your help. I don't fucking need anybody's help. And I said it loud and I didn't mean to. And I guess I said it in such a disrespecting way that other inmates heard it and other sets heard it because everybody's walking as they're going to class. It's movement. And the gentleman who's telling me these rules looked at me. He goes like, you just, he was upset. He goes, you just did that in front of everybody. He says, you want to be a big boy and run by yourself and disrespect us in public? You're on your own fish. And he pointed to a table where there was eight, eight men. I think I counted eight men. 
because he pointed at him and he says, you sit over there with them. Those are your fucking people now. And he turned his back on me and he never looked at me again. Not in the eyes, not in the body. He never looked at me, period, again. But the guy standing next to him who had the same tattoos as him was staring at me and they were fucking mad. And I don't know why I never even heard them talk. I'd seen them pass, you know, packages back and forth. But that's it. Never even heard them talk and they're yelled. So I walk over to this table and I walked the wrong fuck way. I don't know what the fuck, dude. I was walking to a table and I crossed an imaginary line that wasn't there, that was supposed to be there. And I'd be go to hell if some fucking niggas did not ask me what I was doing on their side of the fucking hallway. Now, your side of the hallway? I'm fucking walking. I'm trying to go over there. Some look, fish. I don't care where the fuck you're walking. This is mine. You have to ask permission or pay the fucking toll or fight me for it. Man, I did what I've always done my whole life. Man, fuck you. I just kept walking. They didn't think nothing of it. And I made it to this table. And these guys are looking at me with, with shock and fucking stupidity and unknowingness on their faces. I, that's what I was reading. And the oldest man at the table, he says, look, I know you're supposed to come sit here, but we have to think about this for a second. Because we are alone. And you are a walking disaster who's about to get in trouble. And then something happened. The bell rang. Lockdown, lockdown, lockdown. Ah, fuck, man. They locked us down. So the next time I'm, I'm able to come out of my cell, it's lunchtime, and I'm walking, and I see these guys, and I was going to sit down. But the old man told me, told me he hasn't made up his mind yet. And so I, I ate my first lunch in general population out in front of everybody standing against the wall with no fork because they gave you a spork, a plastic spork, and I didn't remember to grab mine, and mine was in my fucking cell. So I, I ate this really good stew with my fingers. I must have looked like shit. I was depressed, unshaven, unfucked, and I looked like hell. Nobody talked to me. In fact, I was treated with a fucking weird leprosy that whole time out that day. The next day, nobody even looked at me. I tried to engage in a conversation. Even with the cop, I was just asking, you know, when can I get a book? And nobody was fucking talking to me. Whatever, man. Fuck, I understand. Everybody's having a bad time, right? So, fuck, I blow it off. And we lock back down. I don't sleep that night because I'm sad. I'm scared. And I don't even know who the fuck I am anymore. I'm in this weird place and I get out again and this time as I'm walking past everybody and I'm walking in the middle of the aisles through these tables I get to this this table and there's no old man anymore, anymore. in fact the the guy seen there he's a fatter guy he's fat fat dude husky but he's kind of kind of chubby he, uh, he says man come here dude he says, look, there's one spot open here. We just had a man die. He passed away. He can have a seat here, man. We're just trying to 